I'm so glad that so many of you are here. I want to say thank you um, to my hosts that are digital, but, you know, present. Um, it is a real honor to participate in First Wednesdays. I know I've learned quite a lot from other speakers uh, at other times. So, um, yeah, it's always an honor to be here. So I have some good old fashioned images and slideshow. We're going to start with four Muslim for American Muslim, notice that O, oh, ladies. I'm just gonna jump right in, and I promise I'm gonna walk you through quite a lot. There's a lot of text on some of my slides. That's because we can't be in person, and normally when I give a talk like this, I have handouts so you can follow along. Do not feel like you need to read along. I like to think of myself as vaguely entertaining, so I'm gonna try my best to be as lively as possible, though I'm in a rectangle, and you try your best to follow along, and we'll meet in the middle, I promise. Let's look at this image of four American Muslim ladies. It's from 1923. And this image is exactly where I want to start tonight. And you'll forgive me if I'm looking back and forth. I work on two screens. So you're straight ahead and my images are to my right. You've likely never heard of these women, these four Black women in Chicago in 1923. You probably have never seen this image before, even though it was really widely circulated at the time. And I'm going to get to, by the end of the talk, why those things are true, why this could have been a really important image of a really important religious movement, of a really important moment for Black history, religious history, women's history, and American history, and why that remains shrouded in not secrecy per se, but definitely in a not popular way. I wasn't taught this history in school. I am assuming you weren't either. So I'm going to start with these women. If you notice, as you look at them, they are wearing their Sunday finest bonnets, but they've pinned or tacked, depending on the woman, uh, scarves around the, the edge of their bonnet and covering mostly their mouths, so leaving their eyes open. We might recognize this today as a masked look, but I think they were going for hijab or a veil practice. These are women in Chicago in the 1920s, like I said. So part of the great migration of Black and African Americans from the South up the Mississippi to the major um, urban centers along that big river. We know in that moment that religion was really important. We know that Black identity was coming to the fore after the first wave of um, the end of slavery, Reconstruction, and then the like clamp down and, and economic booms that happened after that. And we know that Black women in particular were super important to religion in this moment. So I am really curious as to why this popular magazine that was really well publicized at the time is like a forgotten moment in history. And the spoilers for this talk is it's about gender, it's about race, and it's about religion. We're going to come back to these gals in a little while, but I think this image helps us see exactly what we're looking for. We see Black women leading a community not just any community, a Muslim community. And they're being featured in photographs in a magazine to show it. But it looks a little different. They don't look like they're wearing, say, traditional Arab abaya or um, jilbabs. They don't look the way we might see hijab today. They are innovating religious practice because they are new converts. So all of these moments of American history layered right on top of each other. You don't have to be as excited as I am, but I hope you can tell from my tone that this is a thing that nerds like me get super excited about. But we're not there yet. So let's actually dive into some of what we need to unpack this image together. And there we go. So what are we talking about tonight? I pitched right on the front, critical race theory and intersectionality, words that we have seen become huge talking pipes, points, frankly, from pundits, uh, often on the American conservative spectrum, and from others who just feel like they need to weigh in on it. Vermont's not immune to this conversation, no matter how liberal we think we might be. We've seen critical race theory and intersectionality show up in school board meetings, for example. So I'm going to define what those terms mean and why I think we need them to think about our four American Muslim ladies. But more importantly, I want to talk about these big picture academic theory words like critical race theory, intersectionality, race, gender, religion. 
so that we can ask a more interesting question, I think, which is how do those ideas help us understand the experiences of, for example, Black Muslim women in the United States? The second something like critical race theory becomes a fire branded, politicized terminology, that means we've got to unpack it more than I would have liked uh, when I pitched this talk maybe seven or eight months ago. I've got some facts and figures so you can bite your teeth into something a little bit harder than the ephemeralness that sometimes is theory words or philosophy talk. I've got some tangible examples. So we're going to come back to our four American Muslim ladies, and we're going to come back to some Muslim ladies, Muslim ladies uh, in today's present. I'm joking with this Muslim word. It's an old uh, frankly, dismissive way that folks used to spell Muslim. So I'm I'm joking about it because it's one of the ways we can see racism and anti-Islamic sentiment right in the title. And then I've got some question and resources for you. I'm going to front front load some of those resources. I've sent um, to Wendy and Michelle, and I know the Vermont Humanities Council has already put them online, uh, and you will get them tomorrow with your links that um, that Wendy already talked about. When I do this in person, I come with handouts. Uh, including a list of books that is something like four or five page long, books that are usually available in Vermont public libraries across the state, to the best of my knowledge, um, for you to, to have. So that if this feels interesting to you and you want to know where to learn more, because no one, not even me, and I think I'm pretty good at this job, can do anything really significant in 40 minutes, this way you have some resources at your fingertips. So if something piques your interest and you want to know where you can learn more, please put that in the Q&A and we'll get to it by the end, I promise. All right, so let's jump into those definitions. Critical race theory. There's a lot of words here. Bear with me. I'm not going to read the slide directly. I felt like it needed a lot of words though, because I'm very exhausted by the people emailing me all the time to figure out why critical race theory is sort of coming for their children, like some sort of boogeyman. It's none of that. Critical race theory is an academic concept that eggheads like me came up with over 40 years ago. Frankly, it's kind of boring. The core ideas of critical race theory are really simple. Number one, race is a social construct. That means that even though we think about race biologically, skin color, eye color, eye shape, uh, where you have curves versus where you don't have curves, we have thought about race in bodily terms. Critical race theory is telling us that race is not biological, it is not gene based, it is socially constructed. Even if we use physical attributes sometimes to racialize other, that is to put them in the category of having a race. But more importantly, critical race theory teaches us that racism is not the product of individual prejudices or biases. It is instead something that is embedded in the social fabric, the institutions of any given society. And that can be really local or that can be global. What I mean by that is, it doesn't matter what I personally think, right? My biases are my biases, my prejudices are my prejudices, and they are informed by the world around me. But me changing those biases doesn't change the fact that, like, when Black folk apply for bank loans, they are rated differently in a credit score than white folks. And if you need the citations on that, I can give them, but that's like the institutional easy go-to um, for how racism is systemic and not about personal choice. So despite recent scaremongering, I'm gonna read this part because it's important. Despite recent scaremongering around this set of ideas, the main point and the one I want, I want you to really take with you is that race is important because it is omnipresent and it has real world effects on people's lives and livelihoods, even if it is a social construct. So like I tell my students, just because it it's made up doesn't mean it's not real. Okay, down and dirty, but I think we've got it. Critical race theory spawns this idea of intersectionality. Specifically, a professor named Kimberly Crenshaw coins this term in 1989. So it's significantly older than we would like to think 1989 is, uh, it can drink well without uh, IDs. So this is an old concept. It's become popular recently um, for all sorts of reasons, including the Black Lives Matter movement. Intersectionality can be tricky for folks. So let me walk us through this kind of slowly. Simply put, 
Intersectionality is the idea that we cannot divide people's experiences into neat categories like race or religion or gender or sexuality or class. Because all of those things are acting on our persons and our communities at all the same time. Intersectionality is essentially saying the world is really messy and to divide those ideas up as if they are in silos doesn't actually line up with how people experience the world around them. Crenshaw is an expert on Black women and Black women's access and Black women's access to legal spaces. So shocking no one, perhaps. That's what her, her writing in 1989 is about. And what she does in that writing is to say, and I'm paraphrasing, that Black women experience not just racism and not just sexism at the hands of the court, but rather both working together and something unique, something that studying Black men's experiences in, in the jurisprudential system, you can't get at. And studying women, all women's experience in the jurisprudential in the legal system uh, won't get you that either. So to think critically about the experiences of Black women, you need to actually think about Black women experiencing sexism and racism apart from other isms all at the same time. Crucially, what the theory of intersectionality tells us is that intersecting oppressions magnify and amplify those very oppressions. So, if you are experiencing racism, as Crenshaw argues, and you are experiencing sexism, that Venn diagram where that intersects will be amplified and magnified because you're experiencing both at the same time in new and interesting and sometimes really messed up ways. I want to be clear on this last point that I put in blue, though. A lot of folks come back at me with, everyone has it hard, the world isn't perfect, they're just trying to win. I want you to see my shock face there because that sentiment is racist in and of itself and we can get there if we need to. Intersectionality is not a theory of misery poker. So my grandmother used to call when you try to win it, having it the worst misery poker. No one likes to ante in misery poker, she says. Oh, may she rest. No one wins here. And that's not Crenshaw's argument. And that's not the positionality of critical race theory. What intersectionality as one little piece of critical race theory is trying to say is that it's a descriptive term. This is a way to better understand sociologically, um, scientifically, factually, uh, historically. It's a better way to understand what's going on for Black women in a way that makes sure that we see them clearly without ignoring or dismissing their lived experiences. So this is not misery poker. I've had this conversation loads of times where someone says, right, Black women have it hard, but what about Arab women? Yes. Yes. Arab women also experience intersectional oppressions. Most of us do. Right? So this isn't about winning some race to the worst treated. This is about being able to clearly articulate how and when those identities, sometimes of your own choosing and other times that are thrust upon you, and we'll get to that in a second, affect your ability to live and work and exist in the world. Okay. You don't know it, but you just did two seminars worth of college classes. So congratulations. We're going to keep going. Why do we care? This is the big part. So what, egghead? Why do we care about these silly words that have itty on the end, like intersectionality knows what's a made up word. We care because describing our world accurately is important. For starters, that's where I come at this. I'm an expert on Islam, race, and racialization. I care that we're getting it right. I care also because all people have these identities. All people who lived in a racialized system have a race. All people have a gender. All people have class, have ability, have sexuality. So this isn't just about describing those people over there. It is about describing ourselves. Wherever we fall in a racial, gender, sexuality, class, ability uh, spectrum. I also want to make this about Islam, right? Because that's what you signed up for. Talk about Islam. Islam is the most ethnically and racially diverse religion in the world, and that is doubly true in the U.S. So Islam is the most racially and ethnically diverse religion in the world, and Islam is its most diverse in the United States. So we can't actually think about Islam in the United States without thinking about intersectionality. 
when we are thinking about Muslims, we have to think in terms of diversity, not uniformity. So if someone were to say to you, hey, Islam thinks X, Y, and Z, you with your special uh, Humanities Council approved earbuds should be able to say, that smells uh, like BS because it's too diverse ethnically, racially, age-wise too, but also those practices from around the world have never been stable. So deep breath, I'm about to destabilize us even further. Why do we care about gender? So I said that I was talking about race and gender and religion. So you just did race, we're gonna pause for a second and now we're gonna talk about gender. I care about gender for the same reason we care about race. Everyone has a gender. We often think of gender and our ears hear women, because we are taught to believe that men's bodies are neutral and therefore they do not have gender. But that, my dear friends, is a lie. Every body has gender, whether you identify as a man, a woman, a trans person, or as someone who's non-binary and wants to opt out of that system and refuse to engage in a male, female, man, woman, binary. Everybody has gender. But also how we understand our bodies and how our communities and societies understand our bodies affect how we do religion, right? As a married woman who has children, I know that there are life cycle rights in my own faith tradition, which is Judaism, that are available to me that were not available to me when I was a young girl or that were not available to me before I was a married woman or before I was a mother, right? My body and my identification with my body gives me access to different kinds of rituals and communities based on my gender. We can like that or not like that. That's not the point. The point is it's happening and it's real. The other last piece is that how others understand our gender affects community belonging. So lining up with my gender makes me feel really welcome. Uh, if you identify as trans, you might find more resistance in some religious communities than not, or you might go and create your own mosque, which is what folks have done in Chicago. So I want us to hear gender as another layer of social construct, bodies, impacting religion and identity all at the same time. So in case you're not counting, we've got like four balls in the air that we're juggling because people are messy. So religion is messy. I'm not going to clean it up. We're going to make it messier. What is Islam then? Okay. Woo. Big one. You could come take many classes with me and we still wouldn't get to the bottom of it. But the one slide answer is Islam is the religion of Muslims. Okay. Islam literally means to submit. So it comes from the same root word as salam or peace or hello, uh, but it means to submit literally. Defining Islam in one simplistic way beyond uh, literally in Arabic, it means to submit is impossible and not something I recommend. For some Muslims, Islam is restrictive and uncomfortable and we're walking away from our faith. For other Muslims, this is the best thing that has ever lived and we're so excited to be Muslim and it's great. For some Muslims, it's conservative. For some Muslims, it's progressive. For some folks, it's queer inclusive. For other folks, it's exclusionary. People are messy. So how people do Islam is inherently messy, but we're gonna be talking about it. So I wanted to give you the one slide definition. Islamophobia is the other major kind of key word. And I wanted to start with Islam because Islamophobia is that, you know, there's a root word there and a suffix. Islamophobia is the common word, I'm sure you know, that we use to describe anti-Muslim hatred and uh, attributes. So rhetoric, behavior, laws and ordinances, spaces, for example. I don't, I don't love, I'll love the word Islamophobia. And I don't like it because of that phobia piece. It makes it seem like it's some sort of natural fear, like a reasonable response, like how I'm absolutely terrified of spiders, right? Oh, that's Elise, she's afraid of spiders. Oh, that's Bob, he's afraid of is Islam. No, Islamophobia is a learned behavior. It is a form of systemic racism. It is tricky though. Right? Because I just said, you're thinking, hey, professor, you just said that Muslims are the most ethnically and racially diverse religion in the world. So, how does Islamophobia describe racism against Muslims when we know that there are white Muslims, Black Muslims, Asian Muslims, Arab Muslims, like Muslims from Nova Scotia, no, Muslims from Antarctica? For real, there's like a couple of scientists that live in Antarctica now, like say Muslims are on all continents. To which I say, yeah, this is complicated because we have a hate 
a systematic hate against a religion that is associated with many races, but that systemic hate of religion is also tied to race. So when I said this was messy, I wasn't joking. This is like, I'm trying to bake and I picked up the flour by the wrong side and everything's all over my kitchen. It's messy. It doesn't mean we can't understand it, but it does mean that we need to hold multiple ideas at the same time. So I wanna add this all up for you before I get to some examples. Islamophobia has different flavors. Gendered Islamophobia is the way we talk about the unique experiences of women who are Muslim, who experience hate. We know that that's a thing because women who practice Islam sometimes choose to cover their heads. So they become visible markers of Muslim uh, behavior, Muslim practice, Muslim identity, which means they've also become targets. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Gendered Islamophobia is thinking about Muslims, women, unique experiences with Islamophobia and the way that it relates to women and not men. Um, usually, usually there is some gendered Islamophobia around queerness, but I'm going to stick with women because it's frankly the easiest examples. Anti-Black Islamophobia is at this intersection of anti-Muslim rhetoric and anti-Black rhetoric. So we see that when we see... Um, the FBI is one of the first cases that the FBI ever took on was about infiltrating mosques um, in, in the 50s and 60s. So we see the surveillance of black mosques happen at a higher rate than we do um, non-black mosques. So we've got all of these different kinds of things coming together, I hope right? This intersectionality thing is undergirding our whole understanding of how we think about Islamophobia specifically, and I'll get there in a second, for women in this country and especially Black women in this country. So I've got some cartoons for you because that was a lot of words all in a row. So here's what gendered Islamophobia looks like. One of the major things that folks often talk about when they talk about Muslim women is the veil, the burqa, the hijab. So I'm in the top middle. I'm going to talk about that one first. We see a woman wearing high heels and she has a black niqab on, niqab that just shows her eyes, and a woman who presents as white and is in like a regular skirt and a purple shirt. She's saying, you must be so restricted and uncomfortable. And doesn't this lady wearing a burqa say, I am, but I've only been wearing these heels for 20 minutes. So the joke there, right, is that this woman who's uncovered and presumably not Muslim is saying, the outfit you're wearing is so restricted. And this gal is saying, yeah, it's just the heels, man. Heels hurting is a universal experience of women who wear, or people who wear heels. So the joke is the gendered Islamophobia is about misunderstanding her, her choice of dress. On the right-hand side with this lady wearing a tank top who's pulling off the hijab of, um, of, a, of a woman and she's yelling, hang in there, I'll free you. And she's saying, gah, right? So one of the things that gendered Islamophobia has often uh, had as part of its hallmark is the way that Muslim women need saving. They need saving pre precisely from, as this image shows, liberated white women. That's a form of Islamophobia, right? We're assuming that those Muslim women can't possibly be making their own choices, and we're assuming that their men oppress them. And the only people who could save them are those of us who are free. On the bottom, we have the same idea, right? Both of these women, are the woman in the bikini and the woman in the burqa are saying the other is oppressed because of the way she's forced to dress, which is asking us to confront sexism in our own communities, uh, but also to question our assumptions about what freedom might look like. And then on the most left-hand side, we've got a young woman in um, hijab who's saying, I am, and everyone's answering for her. We see the word terrorist. We see haram from our own community. She's not dressed uh, modestly enough. We see someone yelling backward. We see someone yelling oppressed. So those are the ways that we see women as this classic representation of gendered, the gendered experience of Islamophobia, all of which having to do with the veil, because that's what I picked up uh, and wanted to show you, because we know that veiling actually predicts hate crimes, which is where we're going next. Hang on. No one said this was going to be fun, did they? Because they lied. I want to talk about some facts and figures. So if you don't know what we're talking about here, and the reason I'm bouncing around in terms of um, what Muslims are and who they are, there are about 1.6 billion Muslims in the world that 
but nearly two thirds of those Muslims live in Asia. So our understanding of Muslims as maybe Arab or um, brown, we gotta unpack that. Most Muslims live in Asia. Most Muslims do not speak Arabic as their first language. Most Muslims do not identify as Arab. So when we think of the Middle East as especially Muslim, that's true in a per capita way, but it's not true in a global population way. Muslims don't just live in the Middle East and Africa, uh, the Middle East and Asia. So sizable Muslim communities are around the world. The facts here that I want you to pay attention to is that Islam is the largest religion in Africa, and Africa is one of the most populous continents that there is. North American Muslim communities are growing and they're growing in communities of color predominantly. So when we think about Muslims, we have to think obviously diversity, but I'm hammering home this idea that we need to think about race and gender and especially blackness. We're, we tend to write off um, Africa and particularly Sub-Saharan Africa as, as being Islamic or having a high Muslim population. I'm urging us not to do that. In the US, there's a plurality of Muslims that identify as white, so something like 40, 41%. But white's a weird category, as Neda Magbole teaches us in The Limits of Whiteness, which is a fabulous book, highly recommend. White includes categories like Arab and Iranian, so people that are routinely stopped at the TSA in an, air, in an airport. So folks that we might not readily identify as white, whose names bar them from white privilege, are counted in the census as white. So when we think about white Muslims, I want us to not think like necessarily Europe or white converts. I want us to think that that category includes folks that are a little bit, it's an itchy category is, is the way I describe it. Three in 10 American Muslims are Asian, which includes South Asia. So Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and one fifth of American Muslims identify as black or African-American. Uh, and those things aren't exactly the same, but I'll, I'll use both, both here. So if we're thinking about race and Islam, we can't ignore Blackness and anti-Blackness and the way that those racialized positions affect people's ability to fit in, to pray, um, their safety, their livelihoods. But folks don't always know about Islam in the U.S., so let's talk about it. This gentleman on the bottom right is Omar ibn Said, who's um, one of many enslaved Africans in the U.S. South. He was based in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and we know all about him because he is one of the only enslaved Africans to have left a journal. And if this was class, I'd say, what language was that journal in, everybody? And everyone would say, I don't know, English, it's so interesting that he could read. I thought I was taught enslaved people weren't taught to read. And I'd say, you're right, except he was educated from, from West Africa. And so he wrote Arabic. So his entire journal, one of the earliest examples and one of the um, earliest examples we have in the first person from an enslaved person is actually an Arabic language journal by Omar ibn Said, who um, a team of scholars at the University of North Carolina believe was an imam before he was captured and sold into slavery. So we know that Islam in the United States and black Islam in the United States predates the United States, right? Predates when the United States was the United States because the slave trade is older than that. Up to 30% of enslaved Africans were thought to be Muslim, um, but those estimates are obviously estimates because it's not as if folks um, maintaining slaver, uh, slaver boats and things like that were kind of keeping track along the way. And because once arriving in the, in the South, uh, predominantly, folks were encouraged and sometimes threatened if they didn't practice Christianity. So there was a lot of clandestine practices around Islam in the United States particularly Black Islam. Like I said before, Muslims are the most ethnically diverse group in the United States, but also most Muslims experience intersectional bias as individuals with ethnic, racial, and religious, not to mention gender or sexualized identities. They experience discrimination at the highest rates we've seen in history since we've been keeping track and the highest rates of any one group. So that chart on the right-hand side is from 2020, 
and I think my slide might have cut off the top, but it says Muslims are most likely to experience interpersonal religious discrimination in the public, in work, and in school. So there's not a space where this is not part of their experience. Which is backed up by other surveys. So in 2016, the Pew showed that Muslims uh, are the most disfavorable group of any other group uh, in the United States, which was a record breaking year because it was the first time that someone who believed in God, so like any God, uh, came in first place as opposed to atheists. So America, famously a, a vaguely religious nation, has always really held atheists to like their most rancorous position. But in 2016, we see Muslims win that nefarious position of the most reviled group in the United States, which I say in a joking way because I study hate for a living. And so um, if you don't laugh, you cry, but I don't mean to make light of it. Hate crimes have skyrocketed since 2016. Every year beats the last. Um, and it's targeting not only Muslims, but also Sikhs. That's S-I-K-H. Some of you might pronounce that Sikh. Those are notably men who wear turbans because Islamophobia is not just about Muslims. It is about race. So folks who are mistaken as Muslims, who are read by others as Muslims in public, have been the victims of anti-Muslim hate. I know that feels confusing, but that's where this intersectionality piece is really important, right? Sick men who wear turbans were the first victims of hate crimes after 9-11 because they were mistaken for Muslims. So thinking about race and religion helps us understand why that would be the case. Whereas if we subtract those under understandings of intersectionality or critical race theory, we would miss that story for the trees. We'd miss the forest for the trees there. I wanna say that Vermont's not immune. Um, I'm just gonna leave that there. Vermont's not immune. So if we think this is an outside the, uh, outside the state problem, Please don't think that. Folks, folks have been physically um, attacked on buses in Burlington, where I live, uh, for, for their presentation as, as Muslims. I want to talk about religious freedom. So why do I care about this? And then I'll get back to our four Muslim ladies, I promise. This is a 2020 study out of UC Berkeley that says that women report being uh, the most risk of experiencing Islamophobia. So if you look at that, it's almost 75%, three-fourths of Muslim women report feeling that they experience Islamophobia as compared to men. Okay, so it's a huge difference. We need to think about intersectional oppressions here. But I also wanna point out this graph on the right, the green one that says age groups of US Muslims who hid or tried to hide their religious identity. The elders, not so much, 10% of the 75 pluses are saying, I've tried to hide my religious identity. When you look at the youngest category here, this is where I have a, I have a question for us about religious freedom and what it means to practice religion in the United States. If 44%, nearly half of Muslims uh, in the age of 18 to 29 feel like, right, have hid or tried to hide their religious identity. That gives me real pause as someone who cares a lot about the First Amendment. If we are self uh, sanctioning, if we are trying not to prove that we are religious in public for fear of Islamophobia and violence, the question of where religious freedom fits into this and how folks are proceeding in their universe feels scary to me. So a quick review before we come back to our four Muslim ladies. If you are thinking about Islam and Muslims and are not thinking about race, or if you are thinking about Islam and Muslims and are not thinking about gender, this is your gentle reminder to rethink that. Muslims' experience of the world and their experience of their own religion is absolutely tied up in these other identity markers. We cannot talk about Islam in the United States without talking about Black and African American Muslims. Historically, contemporarily, you name it, this is an important group that gets left out quite often. So in order to understand American Islam and the, and the struggles that American Muslims face, we need to think about race and gender. So let's come back to our four American Muslim ladies in 1923. So like I said before, these are black women, they are converts right at the height of revival movement. So that's across the bandwidth. Think about where we got prohibition from, right? These are revivalist movements. For black folk, it was right at a movement of the great migration, right? You have the boom of jazz, you have the boom of uh, the Harlem Renaissance. This is a moment of black renewal. 
Black folk were also looking to get rid of evidence that white folk oppressed them and enslaved them. One of the ways they did that was to convert to Islam. It was thought of as more authentically, um, frankly, a more authentic Black religion than Christianity. It was thought to be more natural or native to Africa writ large. Now I'm putting that in quotes because we can make every argument in the book that says that that's not true. But what I am trying to say is that's what Black folk, particularly Black converts, were um, identifying with at the time. This is part of an American moment, right? Where Black folk are really trying to say we're free. We have access to economic stability for the first time in American history, probably. There are Black urban centers being set up. Religious renewal is happening. It's also the time of the highest enrollment of the KKK. So I don't want this to sound like we're making American history sound like easy peasy lemon squeezy because it's not. But in a moment where Black women are suddenly becoming leaders, one of the places that they're leading is in Islamic communities. The Islamic community that these women belong to is part of a global movement of Muslims that is specifically meant to be anti-imperialist. It's a lot of words all at once, but it starts in India as a way to protest the British. It comes to America as part of um, conversion, and these women join that movement. They see it as a way to reclaim their own Blackness, their own identity, but also as a way to resist the white supremacist system that they live in and that they experienced, right? These are women who might have been born uh, as sharecroppers, might have had parents born on uh, plantations, might themselves have been born there. They are interpreting Islam as Black, as liberatory, as anti-white supremacist. We can't understand why they're doing all of that if we ignore race, if we ignore um, gender, right? So I am fascinated and enthralled by these women who are doing their best to cover in the way that they know how. It's a mishmash of all of the identities, all of the hats that they wear, and we've forgotten it. We've lost it. This went into some archive in the New York Public Library and only recently became popular because of a really important book by Sylvia Chan Malik. That tells us a lot about where we place Black folk in our own history, which is something that critical race theory looks to describe. It tells us something about where we place women. It tells us something about where we place religion. So I care a lot about all those pieces, and I hope you can see that Venn diagram that I'm trying to draw for you of um, intersectionality and why we care about the intersections and then who gets lost, but also whose stories do we misinterpret from not understanding. Lest you think I was going to leave you in 1923, I want to talk a little bit about Black women today. Um, this was from a leadership meeting in New York City, I think in 2019, I forget. Um, of Black Muslim women who were leaders across their field. So we had fashion designers and animators and politicians and authors and religious leaders and professors, you name it, women leading their fields at this big conference about why Black Muslim women were still not being invited to things like um, the White House Commission on Religious Freedom, like uh, the UN's Commission on Religious Freedom or Islamophobia or, or hate. There's still leaders in their own communities that are often overlooked by systems of power. And there's internal and external experiences of anti-Blackness here. So often within Muslim communities, there's a prioritization of Arab identities over Black identities, which isn't to say that Black folk can't be Arabs because ethnicity is complicated, but there is a hierarchy within the community that has to do with anti-Blackness at home and abroad. And then there's the experience of anti-Muslim sentiment from non-Muslims or the expectation that black Muslims are somehow new or converts or lesser. So it's messy as all get out. But a 2020 study showed that if we were to predict who would be the victim of a hate crime, it is a black Muslim woman who chooses to wear a veil. Which is a really dour note to end on but I want us to think about what we're missing if we're not paying attention to intersectional oppression and if we're misinterpreting critical race theory. Black Muslim women dressed like these women who wear hijab are the most likely targets of hate crimes across the board. That should give us pause as folks who, I'm assuming you're on this team, 
want something better for our communities, our neighbors, our futures, ourselves. So, so what, why does any of this matter? Well, it matters to this common good question that I tried to bring up. It matters so that we're better educated citizens. It matters so that we can better help our neighbors address our problems, address our histories. It matters so that when pundits say things like those Muslims from over there, you have that fact in your head that's like, well, some Muslims are immigrants, but Islam was here since Muslims were forced here as enslaved persons. I think it matters to me that we get our history and our communities right, even if it's messy and complicated. And at the end of the sentence, we almost always have to say, I'm not sure. Because I don't know what the answer is, but I'm not sure that thinking about Islam as monolithic or Blackness as monolithic or women as monolithic is the answer. In fact, I know it's not. And it gives me real pause to know that sexism plus racism plus anti-Muslim sentiment equals we know statistically that Black Muslim women who look Muslim in public are more likely to be the victims of a hate crime than, than anybody else. That gives me real pause. So I hope it matters for the common good. Uh, I hope when we know better, we can do better to paraphrase. Okay, so let's talk and resources. Uh, I am ready for questions. I hope that wasn't too long, Wendy and Michelle, and I'm happy to, to defer to you and how we wanna do Q and A. And as I said, there's resources um, in a handout and I am, I am sadly a, an egghead. So I'm like a walking bibliography if that's useful to you and if not, you could just tell me to be quiet. I'll listen. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. We do have a question, and I do think people will probably want to hear about resources from you. Um, so please share. Our first question, though, says this is probably too complicated for tonight, but I wonder if you could speak about Malcolm X and what Islam meant in the mid 20th century. Yeah, thank you for that question, Heather. I had had a whole thing where maybe I would talk about not Malcolm X, but his partner, um, and then decided against it for all sorts of reasons. Malcolm X has become really politicized for all sorts of reasons. I think the most obvious way that folks learn about Malcolm X is, is or the way I was taught Malcolm X was that there was Martin Luther King and there was Malcolm X. And one guy was Christian and happy and all about peace, and one guy was Muslim and not. He was about fighting back. That dichotomy is really dumb. So I want to say that out loud. Like, I don't like that dichotomy. It's it's ahistorical. It doesn't actually line up. They were friends. Like, it doesn't work out. What Islam meant in the mid-20th century, especially to Black folk, was a way, again, to reclaim roots. So after World War II, we see a huge boom of Black people who were like, this is not it. I did not sacrifice myself. I did not sacrifice my son, my uncle, my brother for a war about what, right? Like freeing other communities in Europe to only come home and be redlined um, into property that didn't work, to be discriminated against, to have Jim Crow on our backs. So Malcolm X is part of a movement in the mid 20th century that says, Islam gives us more of our ability to be black than does Christianity. And you can debate that as, as much as you want in your own communities and, and whether or not Christianity feels black. And there are loads of black Christians. So not everybody felt this way, but loads of black folk, Malcolm X included, felt like Islam could give a better and more inclusive and more authentic experience for themselves. And it spreads in urban community centers, particularly through the nation of Islam, which was a self-articulation of black religion using Islam as its basis. I don't want to go too much further than that, but the way that Malcolm X becomes politicized has a lot to do with the fact that he was kind of unapologetic about how racism worked and affected him. And some of his followers um, took that further, but also because he's hard, he's hard to stomach, honestly. I think Malcolm X prefigures a lot of what um, uh gets labeled now as cancel culture, which I have other thoughts about and don't want to get down that rabbit hole. But I think Malcolm X prefigured some of that where he was willing to say like, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but this is filthy. And we can't get anywhere unless we acknowledge just how filthy it is. And I'm not interested in the rose colored glasses of glossing that over. The other thing that Malcolm X did was he popularized Hodge. So his, um, autobiography of Malcolm X. He has this chapter on Hodge. 
the, the pilgrimage to Mecca. And a lot of Americans had never heard of it before because it was a specialized thing. And so he popularizes this idea. And in that chapter of his autobiog autobiography, um, he says that in Mecca was the first place he didn't feel like he had a color because everyone around him was not, was not white. It was a space of all the colors of the world, white people, black people, brown people. And it was the first time he didn't feel racism. So a lot of black Americans latched onto that as like, whoa, Islam can do that for me. I don't feel that way in my church. Because again, and I'm forgetting whose line it is. I think it was Dr. King, but I don't remember. So the quote is, Sunday at 10 is the most segregated hour in America because there's white churches and black churches. And here comes Malcolm X saying, but Islam didn't make me feel that way. And so you see this boom of um, black Muslim identification. I spoke for too long. It's a fascinating question. There's loads of books on it. High recommend um, anything by Edward Curtis IV. He's a scholar out of Indiana University who is the world's leading expert on black American Islam. And he's written a lot. He has a website that's like super, super accessible. Um, yeah, so his stuff is great. And I know that his book, Muslims in America, is in at least the Fletcher Free Library here in Burlington. So I imagine it's ill uh, wherever you are. Thank you. On that note, I know that viewers are going to get a, a link to your PDF of, of your list of resources. But if they don't click on it, or if they just kind of want the hot take, like what are your favorite go to's? Edward Curtis is really one of my favorite authors. Sylvia Chan Malik, so it's C-H-A-N hyphen M-A-L-I-K, has a wonderful book called Being Muslim, and it's all about women, uh, women of color in the United States practicing Islam. Actually, The Four Muslim Ladies is a ripoff from her book, um, with permission, I know her, it's a cite, it's citation. Um, but she's also someone, both uh, Professor Curtis and Chan Malik are public scholars. So like me, they have a lot of things that are links. And if you Google them, there's videos of them talking. You don't have to buy their book or be a scholar to interact with them. I will shamelessly um, plug my own podcast, uh, Keeping It 101. If, if you can handle me and you're not totally turned off, we have a whole season on race and religion. Some of it's about Islam, some of it's about Christianity, some of it's about religions you probably haven't heard of uh, from around the world, but it's all about race and religion. And um, that's just at keepingit101.com. And then there's a Black Muslim woman duo that has a podcast called Identity Politics Pod, where they talk about the issues they face as Black Muslim women. And sometimes it's inside baseball. So if you don't identify as a Black Muslim woman, sometimes that might not be for you. But most of the time it's like, hey, this is my experience. I'm from Atlanta. Here's this community that I've been a part of. Here's what it's like to go through the world. I think one of them is a social worker and one of them is a, um, involved in politics. I think she does like think tank things, but it's a really interesting, young, I'll, I'll admit it's young. They're in their early, early to mid twenties. And so they're they kind of jibber jabber in a way that feels young to me. Um, but it's really engaging. And again, I like podcasts because you can listen to what you want, fast forward through what you don't, and you don't need to, um, pay for it. You don't need to have access to, to that anywhere. But, Could you give a quick example of like something that they might talk about on that podcast, like an example of what experience they might've had going through the day? Yeah. So um, one of the episodes that I teach that I'm blanking on what number it is, is all about how black Muslims break fast at Ramadan. So the month of Ramadan, Muslims fast from sunup to sunset. And at the end of the day, you break your fast and that there are, there are different food traditions for black Muslims. And so they, they talk about going to a predominantly Asian mosque and feeling really left out because the food that they wanted wasn't food that was there. And the elders in that community had a pretty, let's say, lukewarm feeling about Black folk. And so they were experiencing racism in their own mosque space from other Muslims but also wanted to be there because that's what they wanted to be there for, right? Like it was their holiday, they wanted to be there. So it was this complicated conversation of, I didn't have anywhere else to go. I was in college, this was the place I was going. 
I really wanted this food. They didn't have it. And then when I said why I wanted this food, they made me feel lesser because I'm not racially or ethnically the same as the majority of what that mosque had been. So it's a complex take, um, mm-hmm. but they're, they're fun and funny. And um, again, I think sometimes personal narratives help us connect better than mm-hmm. just some egghead telling you what's what. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from our, from our crowd today? What is one of your most common questions? I get a lot. What can we do? Cause mm-hmm. I love to assume the best of my audiences. So what can we do is you can listen to people when they tell you what their experience is and you can listen to folks when they ask what they need. So, um, it, so like that sounds really basic, but I think like if we want the world to be better, we have to stop assuming that we know best and instead listen to the folks who say, right? Like those cartoons of you must be oppressed. Let me take your hijab. Most women in the United States who choose to cover do so knowing that it makes them a target against ha- of, of hate. So they're not oppressed. In fact, they are brave as hell for riding a public bus wearing hijab, knowing that it's going to be microaggressions, macroaggressions, and possibly violence for doing so. So I think feeling like, oh, that woman must be oppressed is like the feeling I want us to think, oh, do, do we really feel that way? Or why do I feel that way? What's, what's undergirding my, my space? Cause I think when folks cover, they're not, they're not asking for help. They're telling you they're Muslim and they're doing it for their own piety. It's a staggering statistic. The 70 some percent. Yeah. Really. Staggering. Staggering. Yeah, it is. staggering. We do have a couple more questions. Um, have you directly had a conversation with a white perce- supremacist on any of the amazing topics you have covered so brilliantly tonight? Um, I'm a Jewish woman who studies Islamophobia and race for a living. I have not had conversations with white supremacists. I have had many death threats. Mm. So um, I don't, I am the descendant of Holocaust survivors. I do not meet white supremacists on their ground because they do not think of me as a person. So I'm, I'm taking your question, Heather, as like, I don't, I sound combative. I don't mean to sound combative. I wanna be clear that Um, even as a white presenting person, uh, I get quite a lot of hate just for being an expert on this, even though my identities don't line up with the things that they hate. So conversation, no interaction. Yeah. Positive. Uh, -uh, no way. (laughs) Um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, someone says, curious your thoughts about Quebec's Bill 21, which among other things bans wearing of certain, quote, religious symbols for those working in certain public sector sec- service sectors. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about it. The too long, don't have time for it is it's rooted in a, in a real understanding of Quebec and of um, like Quebecois-ness as being inherently white and inherently Christian. Because when we ban things like visible displays of religion, and this is true in France too, and um, I I know a lot of books about it, if if that's interesting to you. um, We're never talking about Christians because you can tuck a cross right right under your shirt, but it's yarmulkes, turbans, hijabs that are targeted. And so what that tells me is that what they assume about public sector is not that no religions allowed strict secularity it's specific kinds of religion that don't line up with an understanding of quebecois um, and whiteness and christianity isn't part of the deal because nuns can be in public that's always my go-to the nuns in a habit can be in public but the women in hijab which almost exactly look like each other uh have restrictions on them And I know Quebec is different than France, but I want to be clear that the connection I'm making isn't just language, it's that understanding of laïcité, of freedom from religion, secularity that operates in the French government that is similar to what I'm seeing in Quebec. Um, I hope that answers the question. It's a good one. Here's our last question. How does the idea of the belief regarding class, et cetera, equality factor into your analysis? 
I'm not sure what we mean by belief, but I think that intersectionality as a framework helps me think that we need to think about these things all the time, right? So wealthy Black women who are Muslim have different access to resources than poor Black Muslim women. Black Muslim women who are new Americans, say, from Somalia and have maybe language barriers will have different experiences of racism, of gender, of class than, I don't know, a 12th generation Black Muslim women in Chicago. And so I do think that um, it's all the things at once, which is why it's messy as all heck. And I didn't focus on class tonight, though I could have, because you saw how many definitions there were. We can only do so many things in 45 minutes, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. That analysis is there. And we know, um, we know that class matters, particularly, frankly, in our state where quite a lot of Vermont's Muslims are part of resettlement and uh, refugee communities, which means they are starting at a level of poverty, usually, though not often, and a level of access linguistically, usually, but not often, that's different than some of their other counterparts in other parts of the country. So those would also add to our uh, Venn diagram of bubbles of what we need to think about to see those folks clearly.